drift on the slope. To transport 28 barrels of stove oil to Lake 30, the C-46 is used. It will take a little over two hours to make the trip across the Yukon River with its Oxbow checkpoint. Past the halfway mark of Lake Chandelar, above the 9,000-foot peaks of the Brooks Range. To the North Slope, stretching 130 miles from the Brooks to the Arctic Ocean. Not long ago, this area was completely uninhabited. Now man-made derricks tower above the horizon, and more than 2,000 workers are dependent upon aircraft to bring their supplies. Lake 30 is not easy to find. It looks like all the rest of the snow-covered tundra, except for a 3,500-foot strip that has been cleared on the ice by a seismographic crew. The C-46 is not as fast, nor can it carry as much as the Herc or the DC-6, but it can land safely on Lake 30 and uses only a fraction of the narrow icy strip. seismographic party is waiting, and the flight crew, using a portable unloading ramp, quickly sends the 450-pound barrels down onto the Arctic ice. Every precaution is taken to assure the success of the operation. One engine is left running to provide heat to the cockpit and the engines. If both engines are shut down, they become cold soaked in just a few minutes. The oil congeals and they cannot be restarted. After the barrels are unloaded, empty ones are placed on board to be returned to Fairbanks. All outside work is accomplished in record time because each breath stings the nose and chokes the throat. No one remains out longer than he has to. C-46 takes off from Lake 30 for the last time. Tomorrow, the seismographic crew will move to another location, and there will be a new strip to search for. No flying in the world is more demanding than on the slope. Blowing snow and ice fog can obscure a field in seconds. Yet there are few navigation facilities, and over 200 flights a day are made into the area. And as the sun dips low to the horizon, the temperature begins to drop, the wind picks up, and the forecast is not too good. Uh, dead on the Seattle Com, this is the gentleman of 61 Zulu Street. 61 Zulu, Dead Horse Street. Uh, Roger, what are you going to do? You might as well there at uh, Dead Horse, go ahead. Yeah, uh, 61 Zulu, uh, it's not too good, sir. We're varying half, uh, half mile visibility most of the times from three quarters down to a quarter. And it's blowing in and out. It's gusting. It's what it's doing about uh, 18 to 24, 25 knots or so. It's just an estimate. The winds are about a zero, six, zero degrees. It's fog and blowing snow. Six one zero, Pluto. Uh, Pluto, six one zero, go. Yeah, I just talked to Fairbanks Center. They said that the Anchorage Center is off the air until further advice, and they said that all you fellows out there just hang tough. Uh, six one zero, Roger, hang it tough. As 6-1 Zulu lands at Crazy Horse, Interior's F-27 makes an approach off the Dead Horse radio beacon. But blowing snow hides the field, and it has to go around. 
Meanwhile, a Hercules is circling above, waiting for his turn, and a Bell 204 passes to the north as unloading begins on the C-46. pieces of lumber are removed, the F-27 makes another approach. Pacific Western's Hercules, non-stop from Whitehorse, Yukon Territory, follows closely behind. The FAA estimates that more than 500 flights a day are being conducted on the slope, mostly with turbine-driven aircraft, which adapt more easily to the biting cold. Along Idaho's Salmon River, Intermountain's STOL de Havilland Twin Otters are making history. The STOL, short takeoff and landing aircraft, is the bridge between conventional airplanes and the helicopter. It carries more useful load over greater distances at less cost than helicopters and can operate out of strips that conventional aircraft could not possibly use. The Twin Otter is a large airplane. It has a gross weight of 11,579 pounds and can carry over two and a half tons. Yet its reversible pitch props permit incredibly short landings, even in rough terrain. The double doors open wide to allow the unloading of bulky items and its roomy cabin can hold just about anything, including the kitchen sink. In spite of its sleek appearance, the Twin Otter is a rugged aircraft capable of operating from unimproved fields in all environments. Its high power to weight ratio and low stalling speed contribute to safe flying, even in the most hazardous areas. And its two 650 shaft horsepower turbine engines are so quiet you can barely hear it approach. Twin Otter's large cabin, high useful load, twin engine reliability, and stow capability make it ideal for use with the Forest Service. During 1969, Intermountain contracted in New Mexico, Idaho, and Montana in support of Forest Service firefighting operations.
Smoke jumper is like the Twin Otter. It is large enough to carry 12 jumpers in full gear and heavy enough to smooth out the bumps. The low noise level permits normal conversation and the exhaust is swept back from the engines away from the cabin. Twin Otter's 150 knot cruise places it over a fire in minimum time as it waits for a TBM to come in for a fire retardant drop to prevent flames from crossing a ridge. This fire started the day before, but high winds prevented the deployment of jumpers. Two Twin Otters now wait for permission to drop as a B-17 spreads 2,000 more gallons of retardant on the ridge. Clarence is received to begin the drop run. The Twin Otter reaffirms its reputation as an excellent jumping platform. short takeoff and landing capability is required, but the operation does not justify the larger, more expensive Twin Otter. The heliporter is the answer. It has a useful load of more than 2,300 pounds and can carry a pilot, co-pilot, and up to nine passengers. The 650 shaft horsepower turbine engine gives it spectacular performance, even with floats, and its reversible pitch propeller permits water landings in only 350 feet and it can even be backed up. The heliporter and the Twin Otter provide the solution when landing strips are marginal. But there are many places in remote areas where even sole aircraft cannot operate, and helicopters must be utilized. High in the Colorado Rockies, a Bell Jet Ranger approaches an isolated ridge. It is under contract to the Air Force to conduct a gravity meter survey and even in the thin air at 12,000 feet, lands with complete control. The speed of the Jet Ranger is an important factor on this contract because of the distances involved. Gravity readings must be taken on peaks from Nevada to Wyoming, and the time saved in transit by the 130 mile per hour Jet Ranger more than offsets its higher cost per hour and reduced efficiency at altitude. Readings can be taken and the equipment relocated on a distant peak in a fraction of the time required by smaller piston-driven helicopters. The Jet Ranger is not only fast, it has a greater range than piston-driven helicopters, and its unrestricted visibility makes it an ideal vehicle for search and exploration.
The Jet Ranger also has other advantages. Its small turbine engine requires less maintenance and provides a higher useful load. And it is a five-place helicopter, which can be a lifesaver. It now carries a sheriff, a doctor, and two guides on a rescue mission. Word has been received of an accident in one of the most remote areas of the Rockies. The only available landing site is near the inlet stream of well-named Avalanche Lake. Six hours ago, on the tailless slope nearby, a fallen boulder struck a young hiker from behind, breaking both legs, one a compound fracture. Her condition is poor, and so are the conditions for landing. Avalanche Lake is at 11,000 feet, and in the warm afternoon air, the Jet Ranger's performance is reduced. The landing site must be approached from the lake, and with very little maneuvering room to go around, there is no margin for error. Landing with close tolerances, the rescue team is placed within a short distance of the victim. She is quickly given emergency treatment and within minutes will arrive at a distant hospital. Helicopters are extremely valuable when working in remote areas, even when the terrain is not suitable for landing. They can deliver supplies by sling load to precipitous mountain ridges and deposit them accurately and safely. Helicopters are expensive to operate and are sometimes not the solution. For those situations where distances are too great or loads too heavy for helicopters and the site will not permit landing by conventional or even stole aircraft, Intermountain completes its air transportation array with aerial delivery capability. It has developed aerial delivery systems such as the Timberline system to ensure cargo penetration to the ground in densely timbered areas. And the side door conveyor delivery system, capable of dropping up to 8,000 pounds of cargo into isolated areas. More than 326,000 pounds of supplies were dropped to Bureau of Land Management firefighting crews in Alaska during 1968 and 69. Intermountain has achieved a high degree of reliability in dropping cargo and can support aerial delivery operations with aircraft, parachutes, related equipment, and personnel. Intermountain's total system for remote air operations provides a complete air transportation service, whether airlifting cargo over long distances, transporting Forest Service personnel to a primitive area meadow, lifting a survey team to an inaccessible mountaintop, or dropping men and equipment on an isolated fire. It has the aircraft, the personnel, and the experience to perform remote air operations anywhere in the world. <laughs> 